the, the terminology we use in complexity theory for these structures that arise are emergent phenomena or emergence. Um, and it does have a mysterious sort of mystical feel because there is no one planning it. Um, there is no one planning. Uh, I live in New York City and uh, on 6th Street there are all these Indian restaurants. The city did not zone Indian restaurants on 6th Street or a flower market um, in the West 20s, but there they are, or that Wall Street would be downtown, or that the rich folks live on the Upper East Side. And yet, that happened. How that happens, it just sort of happens. Uh, there, it's sort of tempting to want to say, well, there is some kind of guide to this, but there isn't one. It's not top-down, it's a bottom-up sort of phenomenon. Uh, information is certainly part of it. And one can sort of look at the self-organization self in a complex system as being a mode of processing information. What is that processing? Well, each member of the, the group, whether it's an ant or a person in the city um, or a cell in your body, is sensing what's outside taking in that information and then processing inside in a sort of, in what I would call a complex fashion. What that means is the processing of the information isn't like a machine. So a cell reads the environment and always gets and then responds in precisely the same way. That's not what happens. If it was, then our cells would be machines and they wouldn't self-organize. But there's always some degree of randomness in every complex system. And this is where the creativity and the aliveness of a complex system comes in. So too much randomness in the system, you don't get any self-organization. Too little randomness, then the system, you know, if it's machine-like, then the system will always self-organize in precisely the same way. And if the environment changes, it's not going to be able to change its self-organization to adapt. So that's a dead end. So you need a little bit of randomness in the system. Um, and that's what allows uh, for creative solutions and adaptation. So if you think about a food line of ants from a distance, you're st looking down at it, it looks like a, a straight line of ants. But if you look more closely, there's always like 3 to 5% of the ants that aren't following the line. That's the quenched disorder, it's called, the, the low-level randomness in the system. It turns out those random ants or divergent ants are essential for the colony to be a creative, adaptive structure. If there's too much randomness, then there's no food line. Then nothing gets accomplished. There's no self-organization. But imagine that there's, every ant is in the food line. Then when the food runs out, who's going to find the new food source? Um, or if a foot gets, uh, you know, if I put my foot down in the middle of a line, those ants are following the line. How are they going to find a way around the foot? It's those ants who aren't part of the line that rapidly find a new route around the, the, your foot. So this low level of randomness in the system is what makes things actually alive and adaptive. So let's say you have um, a cell. And the cell, let's say you have a paramecium that's um, swimming along and it comes up to a boundary. Well, if you're looking at the paramecium, what happens is it will back up and then try again, shifting its uh, direction a little bit, back up, try again, and it'll keep doing it until it gets around. So it looks like this paramecium is trying to find a route around the obstruction. What's actually happening is that the paramecium bumps into the obstruction and its membrane flattens. Now the way a paramecium moves, it has these little hairs, flagelli, like little oars, that are all sweeping in unison together and, um, and propelling it forward. When the membrane flattens, there are calcium channels that open up in that flattened membrane because of the changing of the shape, and calcium starts to flow out of the cell into the environment. And that calcium tells the flagelli to reverse direction. And so the paramecium looks like it's backing up. The membrane straightens itself out again, and those membranes close, and the calcium sort of wafts away. Now, water isn't completely still. There's a little bit of movement in the water, just because the water has temperature. 
there's Brownian motion. So the paramecium is actually being bombarded by the movement of the water. So now that's randomness in the system. And so now the paramecium is aimed a little bit differently. It's going to start swimming forward again bumps into the wall, the same thing happens. So it looks like a process of learning and adaptation of actual sentience, um, but it's also something going on with the internal signaling because of what's changing with the calcium channels, etc. And the randomness is what allows the new behavior. So, so all of this, to some extent, is about information. The question I had is that, so you have um, a flock of birds can look like a solid thing in the sky. Sometimes you can look up and if there are starlings going by, your first uh, sense of a murmuration of starlings is there's this big black shape in the sky that's moving. And then you hear the sound and you realize, oh, it's a flock of starlings. Um, and so it's not a thing at all, it's actually just starlings, self-organizing, interacting with each other to create this structure. But if you go in closer to each starling, well, they're just a bunch of cells. There's no starling there. It's just a, a community of cells that are self-organizing into something that looks like a starling at this level of scale. But at the microscopic level, it's just a flock of cells. Well, if you go into the cell, what's the cell? It's just a flock of biomolecules floating in water at body temperature, which in part is what gives just the right level of randomness in the system. That's why body temperature is so important. Um, if you have a fever and your temperature goes up, there's too much disorder in the system because the water molecules are now moving so quickly that they're bumping all the other molecules all over the place. But if you freeze it, everything stops. That's not good either, so you need this quenched disorder, this limited randomness, and in our bodies, that's partly established by what your body temperature is. So a cell ceases to exist when you go down to the nanoscopic level. It's just a bunch of molecules in water. So are molecules then the fundamental thing? Well, they're just atoms that are self-organizing into molecules. And what are atoms? Well, they're just self-organizing particles. Um, the electrons, protons, neutrons. Um, well, are those the fundamental thing? Well, no, those, there's another layer of elementary particles, the standard model below that. Are those the fundamental thing? Well, no, there's another level below that. And physicists don't agree on what those things are. Strings is one theory, and that's why string theory is, is uh, so popular, because that's one thought. But it's not turtles all the way down. It's, there isn't endlessly smaller things. One thing physicists agree on is that there is a smallest distance and a smallest unit of time. They're called the Planck distance and uh, Planck time. And things can't get smaller than that. So when you get to these smallest things, whatever they are, strings or whatever, are they the fundamental thing? It turns out they're not. Um, the vacuum that we measure um, by space-time is not actually empty the way we think vacuums are. It's an extremely high energy field. And because E equals mc squared, the energy in that field is constantly turning into little tiny particles or strings or whatever. Most of those form in matter-antimatter pairings, and so they just self-annihilate. So energy bubbles up in what's called the quantum foam, uh, I really like that term. <laughs> so you have this foam of energy turning into matter-antimatter stuff, and it's just bubbling and bubbling. But every once in a while, some of those things don't actually self-annihilate, and the particles that don't self-annihilate can interact with each other in exactly the same way we were talking about the paramecium. So strings, or whatever the smallest things are that escape um, the subsiding back into the vacuum, they interact with each other to create quarks and, and such stuff. And they interact with each other to create atoms. And those interact with each other to create molecules and on up through the universe. So the entire universe then is a self-organizing system. And there is no thing that you can identify that is independent, permanent, existent in and of itself. And this is what the Buddhists call emptiness of inherent existence. At this level of scale, I look like a body. 
Lower down, there's no body at all. I'm just a community of cells that are self-organizing, most of which aren't even human. Most of them are bacteria. So, and those cells, when you go down even lower, they don't exist either. They're just a bunch of molecules self-organizing in water. So this self-organization and the randomness that makes things alive is a feature of the universe. It's not just a feature of ants or cells. There's nothing that isn't like that. And, um, and then it turns out that maps very concretely to things like uh, Buddhist metaphysics, Jewish and Hindu mysticism, and that's where things start to get interesting. Mm -hmm.